Good evening. I'm Tom Cadigan, Associate Director of Alumni Relations, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Alumni Education Live Web Lecture titled, The Election of Pope Francis. What does it mean for global Catholicism? A timely topic, especially considering the events of the past week. Tonight's presentation, offered for all Holy Cross alumni, parents, and friends, will be presented by Matthew Schmaltz, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the college's honors program. Matt holds a PhD from the University of Chicago and is an expert in Catholicism in non-Western worlds and modern religious movements. And we are grateful to have Matt join us tonight, especially on short notice. And I encourage all of you to participate in tonight's live lecture by sending us any questions or comments that you may have throughout tonight's presentation. Just click on the chat button located on the screen in front of you, or you can send us questions by Facebook, Twitter, or email. And at the end of his short presentation, Professor Schmaltz will answer as many of your questions as time allows. Again, thank you for joining us, and now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Matthew Schmaltz. Oh, thanks, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, when I was approached about this opportunity, I was really, really excited. And I only wish that we could physically be in the same classroom and really have some intense interaction. Because my most transformative moments professionally have certainly been in the classroom here at Holy Cross. And if there are any former students of mine watching tonight, let me express my deepest gratitude for the many ways you have enriched my life and I also want to express my gratitude to all the alumni watching tonight. You know, even though I perhaps haven't met uh, very many of you personally, I do want you to know how much you contribute to the mission and identity of Holy Cross. And this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to together extend our discussion and our learning beyond the classroom. And this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why Holy Cross is such a great place to teach. So in the next 15 minutes of my formal uh, remarks, I'd like to share with you some reflections on the recent election of Pope Francis, uh, Jorge Bergoglio, the former Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And I'd like to begin with a question uh, that I often ask myself about Catholic matters, both personal and professional. And that question is, what would Kamala say? Uh, as you can see in the slide, this is Kamala. Uh, Kamala is a North Indian Catholic, and I met her during my dissertation research at a rural North Indian Catholic mission. So she's a convert to Catholicism and also a member of an untouchable caste, which means that she's considered to be so impure, so polluting, that she's literally untouchable. And as a widow, she lived with her son in a one-room hut uh, segregated from the main village. And so when I first met Kamala, about 20 years ago now, I was particularly concerned with academic and intellectual issues of the kind that graduate students usually think about to write their dissertation, particularly diagramming the relationship or interrelationship between Catholicism and Hinduism. And so I also brought to Kamala's village in North India my concerns as an American Catholic. I was born Catholic, grew up in Amherst, Mass, uh, just about an hour and a half away from here. And so I had all these concerns and questions that a lot of young people do about authority in the church, questions about what it means to be Catholic, and also a very deep awareness of the divide that often separates American Catholics between so-called liberals and conservatives in the church. And that divide, I'm sure, is familiar to all of you, uh, uh, concerns teachings about sexuality, social justice, and other matters. So in any case, I came informed with a variety of questions shaped by my own experience as an American Catholic. Well, in any case, I found that with Kamala, these issues were so distant from her experience as a Catholic in India that they were quite literally incomprehensible. Uh, so for example, she supported aggressive uh, Catholic programs in social outreach and aid, but she thought that nuns should still wear habits and that the, la the mass should be celebrated in Latin. Uh, 
she was also an exorcist uh, of all things, and that was part of her caste duties, something that she was expected to do because of her social position in society. And that position as an exorcist had also been accepted by the Catholic Charismatic Movement, which is very big in India. And some of you might be familiar with the Catholic Charismatic Movement. It originated in Notre Dame and Duquesne universities in the late 1960s. And it focuses on claiming charismatic or Pentecostal gifts, such as speaking in tongues, prophecy, and of course, healing. But in spite of this role as an exorcist, and she certainly didn't think that women should be priests, um, and in any case, she understood her own gender identity in a very different way than would be understood in the Western world. So seen from a conventional American perspective, at least the perspective that I came with uh, when I first met Kamala, a lot of aspects of her Catholicism or her Catholicity were distinctive, foreign, or incongruous. And so what I learned through Kamala and other Catholics in her village is that there are different configurations of Catholic beliefs and practice throughout the world, and that American ways of viewing things were not necessarily widely shared or self-evident. So mind you, Catholicism in Kamala's village was identifiably Catholic. There's the Eucharist, um, the position of the priest, saying the rosary and so forth, but also it was very, very different, and she was concerned with very, very different kinds of issues uh, than I was or that my fellow American Catholics were that you know, I grew up with. So this brings us to the election of Pope Francis, a Latin American pope and a Jesuit who has taken the name not Ignatius, but uh, Francis. And so initially then what we're seeing is a constellation of images, references, symbols that have a different configuration than what some of us might be used to. Um, at least within an American context. And so this should at least give us pause, you know, pause for a moment to reflect on what all this means, not only for Catholicism as we might understand it and experience it in an American context, as diverse as that is, but also for global Catholicism as a whole. So I was fortunate enough um, to be involved in a lot of media discussions before the conclave. And what I want to share with you first is how the conclave uh, in the period leading up to the election of Pope Francis was framed. So leading up to the conclave, as far as I'm sure all of you know, there are a variety of predictions made about the kinds of issues that the cardinals would be interested in or would consider in electing a new pope. Um, and so I was often asked about um, these issues, whether I was on TV or on the radio or also um, through my blogging for the Washington Post. Um, and so I was asked about how I saw things developing. And so there was a lot of speculation about the global aspects of Catholicism and how that would relate to the selection of the next pope. But what I realized when I was asked these questions by the media um, is that a lot of them were framed from a distinctly American perspective. And, that it, and an American perspective that didn't necessarily translate well into considering the broader ramifications of the papal election for American Catholicism. So the first question I was asked, uh, which I'm sure many of you uh, would ask as well, and I would certainly ask as an American Catholic, was about the sexual abuse scandal. Now clearly this is an important issue, uh, and it's an important issue for reasons that I really don't have to go into, because it cuts to the very heart of the relationship between laity and priests. But it's also not seen as an issue uh, in Catholicism in the Global South, Kamala's village, um, or many other parts in the Catholic world, particularly in Africa, uh, and let alone Latin America. And so the behavior and, and conduct of priests and bishops is still an issue, obviously, in different Catholic contexts throughout the world. But it most often would be uh, linked to issues surrounding poverty, priest priestly lifestyle, um, humility, sometimes to celibacy, but in a different way than in an American context. And so when the cardinals were thinking about the sexual abuse scandal um, and when the media was reflecting upon it, it did uh, reflect particularly American concerns about transparency in the church that weren't necessarily shared uh, throughout global Catholicism. And so I was also asked questions about whether the cardinals were <coughs> uh, interested in continuity or change. Um, 
And when I was asked these questions about continuity and change or continuity versus change by the media, uh, it was always framed in theological or doctrinal terms. That is, I was often asked whether the next pope would change or continue Catholic teaching on hot-button issues like celibacy, contra uh, contraception, or women priests. And the point is, for someone like Kamala, who's in a North Indian village and so forth, and many Catholics in the developing world, these are not the issues that are most important to them. After all, if you're living in a segregated section of a village and you're concerned about your next meal and don't know where it's coming from, you don't have a lot of time to reflect on the kind of broader cultural issues that Americans like to debate about and like to link to their understanding of Catholic identity. With the media, too, I was also asked about the Vatican bureaucracy or the curia. And I'm sure, as many of you know, uh, in the last year and a half, there was a dumping of confidential documents. It's called the Vatty Leak Scandal, which exposed various allegations of nepotism and corruption and so forth at the Vatican. And so while many cardinals and bishops were certainly concerned about this, some of them were much more concerned about what they understood to be Vatican meddling in the affairs of local bishops' conferences. So this was clear, for example, when Tom Landy, the director of the McFarland Center, and I went to India last month for a conference. And there were there a number of Indian cardinals who theologically, certainly by American standards, would be considered very conservative, were very critical of how the Vatican had reined in their autonomy when dealing with issues that were particular to an Indian context. But their concern about what they understood to be Vatican meddling in their affairs and so forth didn't necessarily translate into a concern for transparency within their own local bishops conferences. And of course, especially in relation to global Catholicism, I was asked questions about demographic changes in the Catholic Church worldwide. After all, approximately 40% of Catholics worldwide either live in Latin America or, uh, or are of Latin American descent. So the gravity of Catholicism has clearly shifted south. But it's also important not to understand this in an unnuanced way. Uh, issues, for example, can in, for the Catholic Church in Argentina, which does not have a sizable indigenous population of Native American peoples, are not necessarily the kinds of issues that the Catholic Church faces in Peru uh, or Bolivia or Brazil. So even if we talk about the global south, uh, we have to realize that it covers a broad area uh, of cultural, linguistic, and political diversity. So there was a final point uh, that came up in some discussions and some reporting on the lead up to the papal election, lead up to the papal conclave. Um, and I mentioned this somewhat in my interviews with the media, but only really peripherally because I was more focused on these issues of internal church politics and north-south divisions within the global Catholic Church. And this issue was the issue of personal holiness, of having a pope that personally gives witness to Christian values. And many cardinals actually did talk about this before the conclave. Uh, they said that a prerequisite for any pope, for any successor to Peter, needed to be saintliness, and that this was the primary issue on their minds. But I think a lot of us, myself included, uh, saw this consideration as a little too vague. Uh, and so when the conclave began, no front runner was identified. And for, as for me, I had identified a couple of Italians that I thought might, uh, might win, but I wasn't particularly sold on either one of them. So, um, as the conclave began, there was, as you know, a lot of speculation about a wide open race and uh, what that could mean. So what happened at the conclave? I'm sure many of you have read reports about this. Certainly the Italian media is all over what happened at the conclave, alleges various conspiracies against Italian cardinals and, and so on and so forth. But in my view, it was the last issue the issue of personal holiness that dominated the way in which the cardinals framed their choice in the Vatican. So to be sure, as many of you know, Cardinal Bergoglio was at least reportedly or allegedly the runner-up in uh, Joseph Ratzinger's election to the papacy in 2005. Many th this time around thought he was too old, and so he never really appeared on lists of papal contenders and so forth. But what was clear, at least in retrospect, is that many cardinals did know him personally. Uh, 
uh, and they knew him personally as a man of integrity and humility, and this perception is what prevailed, it seems to me. And in an interview given after the conclave, uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan uh, said that the new popes, that is Pope Francis's, Latin American identity was quote unquote gravy. And what he meant by that, it was sort of icing on the cake. It was, it was something that was really important, but it really was in the end a secondary concern to, in relation to the issues of personal holiness. Um, and so other issues, such as the sex abuse scandal within the Western world, continuity and change, uh, theologically or administratively, dealing with the Vatican bureaucracy, all these issues were seen in the Cardinal's minds as best handled by a pope uh, who had not really committed himself to at least too many specific policy positions. Instead, it seems to me that the hope was that the pope, uh, pope would have the right personality uh, to discern the appropriate course of action. And so again, it was the personal qualities of holiness that uh, seemed to be foremost on the cardinal's minds. So what do we make of Pope Francis? Um, and as all of you I'm sure know, which is one reason why you're here, this is the first pope who's a member of the Society of Jesus. And this does mark, it seems to me, a kind of official rehabilitation uh, for the Society of Jesus, at least in Vatican circles. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. There are always these rumors that, Vatic that uh, the Jesuits are perceived to have too much power, they're perceived as too progressive, and so on and so forth. Um, but the very fact that a pope who uh, was elected who is a Jesuit is uh, a major affirmation of the work and the vision of the Society of Jesus. Uh, and what's obviously most important is that Pope Francis will bring that Jesuit spirituality uh, into the papacy. And it's obviously a spirituality that's impacted all of us in very deep and profound ways uh, in our experience here at Holy Cross. It's an emphasis on discerning, um, discerning the will of God in our personal lives, on perceiving God in all things, and, and, and having a radical openness uh, to God's call in our lives. But choosing the name Francis also brings in an element of Franciscan spirituality. I wrote a little bit about this in the Washington Post. And so there's also then an emphasis on corporal and spiritual works of mercy, exemplified, of course, in the life of St. Francis of Assisi, from which the Franciscans take their name. So already then, you have a configuration of elements that are obviously Catholic, uh, distinctly Catholic and irreducibly so. But they're nonetheless different from what we've seen uh, on the in the papacy, certainly in most of our lifetimes. Um, and I think we saw these different configurations of Catholic religious sensibilities in Pope Francis's first appearance. So right before his name an was announced, I was on the radio with an anchor from Vatican City. So I was talking over the phone and I could hear the roar of the, of the crowd in the background and so forth. It was a really exciting moment for me. Um, and so it was minutes before the new pope was going to be announced and so the anchor needed to uh, take up some time. So he asked me what my prediction was. So my prediction was that it would be an Italian who was elected because the conclave was so short. Uh, you know, it, it, needed, it obviously was a cardinal that everyone knew had to be one of the uh, Italian front runners. Well, I was obviously really, really wrong. Um, and as I've said in other interviews, I'm actually pretty happy that I was wrong given the way things turned out. And I think many of you would agree with me that uh, Pope Francis's first experience was a remarkably moving experience. And I quite literally teared up. I mean, I never really seen anything like it. And so he referred to himself not as the Pope when he introduced himself, but as the Bishop of Rome. And he asked for the silent prayers of those who were assembled in St. Peter's Square below. And so this kind of humility, you know, the simplicity of gesture was both Franciscan and Jesuit. And it also, at least in my view, uh, draws upon paradigms of how at least some bishops in, in Latin America understand their relationship um, with the laity, that is one of pastoral service um, and closeness. And so <clears throat> this sense of, of humility and of service and of combining different kinds of elements from the Catholic tradition also finds expression in his coat of arms. And so I got this from the Vatican website and maybe some of you have seen it already. But it's really very interesting. So like his predecessor, Benedict XVI, Pope Francis has, chose, has chosen the bishop's mitre uh, for his coat of arms instead of the papal tiara. Uh, and that's particularly significant because for both uh, 
uh, Benedict and now for Pope Francis, this is uh, emblematic of their primary identity as the Bishop of Rome um, and, and in, in communion with um, other bishops throughout the world. Then, of course, there's a seal, the Society of Jesus, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, the first three letters of Jesus' name in Greek, the sunburst, and the three nails representing the three vows. Then there's a blue field, um, obviously representing Mary, but also recalling Argentina, at least in my view. And then there's a star, uh, also associated with Mary, and the two bros, which is associated with St. Joseph, the patron of the church. So I would say then, even though there are a lot of ways to spin Pope Francis's election politically in terms of demographic dynamics within global Catholicism, I really think that his most um, important um, aspect or characteristic is his humility and, and simplicity. So overall for global Catholicism, I think that we'll see configurations of belief and practice that are all quite consistent uh, with Catholic doctrine and so forth, but that will be different for at least American sensibilities, which are very focused on American concerns and American experience. Um, so that means I think that there'll be a greater space for reimagining Catholicism's relationship with the contemporary world. There are, of course, always rumors surrounding a new papacy. Um, people have a tendency, whatever their particular uh, disposition, to project their own hopes or their own fears onto a new pontiff. So there are rumors, for example, about Pope Francis perhaps allowing contraception in marriage or even married priests. And I'm really not sure to give credence to any of these reports because there quite clearly is a doctrinal continuity between Francis and Pope Benedict XVI and Pope John Paul uh, II. So I wouldn't expect big theological changes. But what I do expect is a change in emphasis that will bring a Latin American sensibility into the papacy and one that will in turn highlight the diversity and unity or the unity and diversity that so characterizes global Catholicism. And so obviously within the United States, Latino voices will take the rightful place to be heard in the considerations of the meaning of Catholicism in the contemporary world. But I think all of us will be prompted by Pope Francis to think about Catholicism beyond the ideological divides that so often characterize contemporary Catholicism. So my hope is then that this pontificate will not only be one of humility and simplicity, uh, but also a pontificate of reconciliation uh, in which all Catholics can come together to represent, acknowledge, and embrace uh, the diversity in the encompassing community and unity of the Catholic Church worldwide. And so with that, I'll end my formal remarks and turn to some of your questions submitted via the chat room. It might take me a, while, uh, a couple minutes, well not a couple minutes, but a bit to uh, call up the questions. Okay, one question is, Pope Francis indicated that there might be a need to discuss the question of married clergy. Any thoughts on whether this might be carried forward in a meaningful way? I mean, certainly, as we all know, there are married clergy within Catholicism. And uh, the most recent example of that are Anglican priests who have been accepted into the Roman Catholic Communion. So it is then, within Roman Rite Catholicism, a discipline that could potentially be re-examined. Um, my own sense is that right now, Pope Francis is going to move slowly, um, and that what he wants to do particularly uh, is to, re or to establish his relationship with the people of Rome. He's uh, talked uh, in a variety of ways about um, his primary responsibility as a bishop. So I don't think we'll see any um, uh, serious discussion of that issue within the near future. But I think what might happen uh, is that the way in which Pope Francis will, will talk about Christian obligation, particularly to the poor, will open new ways of, of bringing women into meaningful roles within the church. And I think what we would see certainly before Mary clergy might be more women in administrative positions in the Vatican, um, and then perhaps um, um, at least a, a reconsideration of the priesthood, um, though it may not go as far as um, allowing married priests. 
but um, predictions are always difficult. But interesting question. Where or when do you think the Pope will take his first trip? South America or Africa? Um, I'm sure there are people in Ireland betting on this question right now. Uh, and what I've heard is that the Pope kind of wants to be a homebody at first, uh, that he really wants to stay in Rome and to interact uh, with Romans. But I would think, and you know, I'm not a betting person. My wife would not allow me to bet. So uh, anyone listening to me, I'm, I'm not going to do this. But if I had money to bet and were allowed to bet, um, I would say he would go to Argentina. But he also might uh, pair that with another trip um, to another country in Latin America. Um, so that he brings um, a more uh, inclusive um, symbolism to the visit as opposed to simply going to his homeland. But interesting question, interesting question. Um, given that personal holiness was a favor factor, uh, <coughs> given that personal holiness was a major factor in Cardinal, uh, given that personal holiness was a major factor, was Cardinal O'Malley a major contender? Was the Pope's selection of the name Francis a nod to Cardinal O'Malley as a future successor? This is a great question because in all the media outlets I went to, you know, many of them were in, in Boston. Really, in the end, the first question was, you know, what about O'Malley? You know, what is, you know, is he a serious contender? And my my initial reaction, I ha you know, I'm I guess I'm embarrassed to say it, but I have to admit it was that there is no way. Cardinal O'Malley is a serious contender, not because he isn't a good person, I and mean, he's obviously a man of great holiness, um, but simply because he's an American. But since, but, um, since the, the early stages of speculation surrounding the conclave, it really did seem that um, uh, O'Malley was a serious contender. And so I wouldn't say that the choice of name Francis was necessarily a nod to O'Malley. It is, however, quite clear to me that um, Cardinal O'Malley is held in quite great esteem by the College of Cardinals, uh, particularly for his personal holiness and for his um, work toward reconciliation in the wake of the sexual abuse scandal in Boston. So I do think, I do think that uh, depending upon how long this uh, pontificate lasts, that Cardinal O'Malley could be a contender. And I certainly wouldn't have said that uh, three weeks ago. Um, so we are really in a new phase of, of Catholicism, at least um, in terms of bringing in um, voices uh, and leadership from beyond the confines of Europe. Oh, this is a really good question. How does his being a Jesuit and possibly you know, Franciscan, in, in this case, um, giving a nod to Franciscan spirituality. Um, how does being a Jesuit and possibly a Franciscan impact the recent emphasis on the new evangelization in Catholicism, especially among the laity? Um, as many of you, I'm sure, were aware, one of the, the most specific emphases of Benedict's last year as Pope was a new evangelization, a way to revivify the Catholic faith um, not just through catechesis and, and proclaiming clearly Catholic doctrine, but through a more broader engagement with society as a whole. And oftentimes, for example, Twitter and, and podcasts or, or programs like what we're doing now um, would be considered you know, under the rubric of the new evangelization. And I think uh, Pope Francis, as a Jesuit, will be very, very open to what is new, that is, in, in the sense that there need to be new means to proclaim uh, the message of uh, redemption and salvation in Jesus Christ. And so he'll be open, certainly, to um, popular media. I don't think he, he's, he's, he's already tweeted once. You know, I can't imagine him doing a lot on Facebook, but he'll certainly have a Facebook page. Um, and so as a Jesuit, I think he, he'll bring this, this openness to, to what is new. But on another level, I think his Franciscan side will be very, very interested in interpersonal uh, interaction. And I think we've already seen this. And so this is obviously not a pope who's going to hang out in chat rooms the whole time or, uh, or be tweeting. I mean, at the center of his ministry is going to be a kind of personal outreach 
uh, not just to other cardinals and to other bishops, but to the laity. So I think um, his Jesuit background will allow him to do both in a very creative way, one that will be pastorally very sensitive, but also have a lot of intellectual sophistication. Question, how will religious education change, if at all, in the US based on his Jesuit background? Well, I don't have any inside knowledge uh, about this, but I would guess that Jesuit schools, such as Holy Cross and, and high schools, are thinking that this is a wonderful branding and marketing opportunity. I mean, that being able to um, um, identify the Jesuit tradition with the successor of Peter um, is obviously something that, that brings um, Jesuit education uh, once again into the forefront of uh, education worldwide. What I think, however, interestingly enough, is that Pope Francis's personal example of humility, of simplicity, and openness will reaffirm um, what's already going on at a lot of Jesuit institutions, which is community-based learning and, and moving outside of the classroom, uh, moving outside of a rarefied atmosphere where you're talking about theology, or complex math problems, and really in, uh, having education engage the, the lived experience of people. Something that we're doing here at Holy Cross with a very, very uh, sophisticated uh, program in not only community outreach, but um, learning within, within the Worcester area, community-based learning. And I think Pope Francis's distinctive take on Jesuit spirituality and Franciscan spirituality will affirm um, a lot of the new trends that one finds in Jesuit higher education, particularly here at Holy Cross. Question, what do you think the relationship will be between Popes Francis and Benedict XVI? We know he has already spoken to him at least once already. My mind has actually gone back and forth on this issue um, a, var a variety of times. When Pope Benedict resigned, um, I was really, really very struck by the resignation um, as an act of humility, that he was clearly indicating that he wasn't attached to the pomp and circumstance of the office as a person, um, and so he could let it go. Then it became clear that Pope Benedict um, would be called Pope Emeritus, uh, and that he'd still wear white, even though he, he wouldn't wear his red Prada shoes. And I thought that was kind of strange, actually, because I would have thought that he would have also renounced many of the um, um, visible, visible signs of being pope. I can understand why he didn't. I mean, he was, he was inaugurated as pope, um, so carrying the symbols of the office um, with him, at least to a certain degree, makes sense. But I thought that that might indicate that he would play you know, maybe a greater role in the pontificate of the new pope. Now my thinking has gone back to where it was initially. From everything that I know about Benedict, um, he uh, will uh, pledge his obedience to the new uh, successor of Peter. Um, and so I don't think he'll be involved in terms of um, advising Pope Francis on particular issues surrounding, relating to the Vatican Curia and bureaucracy or doctrinal matters. Um, but oftentimes, I think Pope Francis will um, perhaps meet with uh, uh, the Pope Emeritus um, to share stories or, or perhaps share mate, which is uh, what Pope Francis uh, seems to like. So I don't think in any case that uh, Pope Benedict will be um, really involved behind the scenes, at least in the way that maybe I suspected initially. Okay, two more questions. Okay, what do you think is the single most important challenge facing Pope Francis and the church in 2013? I think the consensus uh, is that the first issue that has to be dealt with is the Vatican bureaucracy. There's a lot of dissatisfaction with how uh, the Vatican has been administered in recent years. And so what I understand is that uh, Francis has tentatively reappointed many of the heads of dicasteries or departments within the Vatican, but he's also holding off on making a final decision. And so I think um, he needs to have a leadership team in place um, and a bureaucracy that's more streamlined, more 
um, perhaps concerned with um, uh, global Catholicism. And so that will be, I think, the first focus of his pontificate. One more quickly. Uh, what would you say is the most underappreciated or ignored legacy of Pope Benedict XVI? Well, I really do think that Pope Benedict um, was a remarkably challenging teacher, and I really think that his encyclicals will be uh, the touchstones for the Catholic intellectual life for, for generations to come. I think his most underappreciated legacy uh, was really his, his, his thinking on economics and social justice issues. Um, that often did not get the kind of emphasis that it should have, but his Catholicism was a Catholicism that was a holistic vision. It emphasized issues such as authority, um, obedience to the magisterium of the church, but that included issues related to what we would call the gospel of life, but also issues related to social justice. So that'll have to conclude my remarks for this evening, and I want to thank you all for uh, tuning in. And again, um, being at Holy Cross has just been a transformative experience for me. And while I'm sorry that we couldn't have interaction within the classroom, I thank you all for your time and attention and your commitment to the mission and identity of Holy Cross. Thanks again. Well, we want to offer our sincere thanks to Professor Schmaltz for sharing his knowledge and his expertise with us tonight on this very timely topic. And I encourage all of you to continue tonight's discussion by visiting the Holy Cross Alumni Facebook page. Just search Holy Cross Alumni and tonight's presentation will be one of our discussion topics. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.